three days ago, we read in the Torah about a man named Korach who said to Moshe, what do we need a leader for? We're all holy, we're all great, what do we need a leader for? And the earth swallowed him up. <laughs> <laughs> Look, the Jews in, in Egypt saw 10 plagues, a plague a month, that's how it was. Each plague was in its own month. So for 10 months in a row, there were plagues on Egypt. Not convincing? Even the Egyptians were convinced. <laughs> but not very deeply, because three days later, after the Jews left Egypt, they go running after them to capture them and take them back. And then there's that ultimate miracle of the splitting of the sea. Now are you convinced? Right after the splitting of the sea, the Jews complained, there's no water, what are we going to drink, what are we doing here? Questioning God's plan. God. So, for, first, that's so Jewish. <laughs> it really is. God turned water into blood. Cute. <laughs> God bought frogs from all over. Okay. <laughs> That's why I should worship him? I'm impressed. I, I, can, I can't make frogs. <laughs> Split the sea. Whoa, that's, that's impressive. But so what? So I'm going to devote my life to somebody who can split a sea? Why? That's so Jewish. Yeah, yeah, you're very talented, big shot. Why should I serve you? But when God spoke to us at Mount Sinai and said, I am yours, that we can't get over. Now I know what God means, what it means to serve, to serve God to worship God. Worship him because he splits seas? That could be a little bit idolatry. So if somebody else with, ma with powers and magical ability splits a sea, I'll go worship him too? It's like marrying a man for his money because he has a lot of money. And when you meet someone who has more money, what are you going to do? <laughs> so we're not easily impressed. Like in this story, any chassid who hears the story, what impresses you? Wow, the Rebbe changed their nature from not having children, whatever medical problems there were, and all of a sudden, because the Rebbe wanted and, and, and gave a blessing, they have children. Wow. I don't think I could do that. I can try. I don't think I could do that. <laughs> but is that what you're excited about? Is that why you're, you're, you're passionate about the Rebbe? It was more the way he treated the man. He's on his way to holy prayer. All day long, he's been getting calls and letters and messages from people, from community leaders, from world leaders, big issues, big problem, life and death. And this guy comes and stands in your way interrupt your schedule against all the rules. The Rebbe didn't say, excuse me, you have an appointment? Excuse me, I'm on my way to prayer.
that's awesome. His commitment and his obligation and his responsibility to this one guy is just as important as his prayers and just as important as all the big issues he just dealt with in his office. That's called the Moshe of our generation. He can go up to heaven and bring Ten Commandments down to earth, and he can run after a lamb that got lost. With the same devotion. Just, you know, just uh, speculating. When the Rebbe came home at night to the Rebbetzin, what did he tell her about his day? <laughs> Imagine she asks him, how was your day? He would say, well, I got a phone call from uh, the prime minister of Israel, and or I got a phone call from this doctor who has a patient that's uh, in, in, in danger and uh, the surgery would be very risky. Should he risk it? Not life and death. I don't think that ever would mention any of that. I think that ever would say, a man who didn't have children came and he promised to put on film. That to the Rebbe is something he would want to share with his wife. Because not only is it as important, it's in some way even more important. Because it's personal. And that's how all of Judaism should be. Our re relationship with God should not be cosmic. Shouldn't be a global issue. It's personal. Ruth Friedman, why is putting tefillin on personal? Because the only reason you're doing it is because he asked you to. It's not an emergency. The world's not going to end. You're not big leaders making big decisions. It's just personal. I know when I put on tefillin, it is pleasing to God. Is it earth shattering? I don't care. If it's pleasing to him, I will do it. It's romantic. Torah is romantic. It is. Very <laughs> Friedman, especially when you speak about it. Not so many people speak about Torah and um, God in such a romantic language like you do. Why is that? I, I, you have to ask them, <laughs> why don't they see all the romantic notions and statements? And It's everywhere in the Torah, and it's not even nice to ignore it. You know, God is trying to be intimate, and you're just business-like. Oh, yeah, you want me to do that? How many times? Well, four times? Okay. What, what's wrong with you? How can you be so jaded? But I think that's what happens. It becomes, a, it becomes a ritual. It becomes a habit. And you become jaded. You go through the actions. You're not even thinking. Whose mitzvah are you following? Why are you doing this? And that takes all the romance out of it. I mean, imagine a husband coming home on his anniversary and saying to his wife, I got you something. You got me something. It's so, <laughs> it's so pathetic. <laughs> what, you thought I forgot about the anniversary? I didn't forget. I got you something. This is This is how you... That's sad.
because he invests more from his side than we're investing. So it's it's not it's not it's not good communication. To God, every mitzvah is a romance, and to us, every mitzvah is an obligation. This is not nice. What do we do to change that? Read the Torah again and pay attention. The Jews commit a terrible sin. God is very angry. Moshe pleads 40 days and 40 nights to gain forgiveness for the sin, the golden calf. Finally, after 40 days and 40 nights, God says, I forgive him. You win. God says, I forgive them. I'm not going to wipe them out. I'm going to take them to the promised land. In fact, I'm going to send an angel to guide you to the promised land. It's so spine tingling. Moshe says, an angel? We don't want angels. If you're not coming with us, we're not going. So first of all, the confidence to be able to say that to God. Particularly after you just barely got forgiveness for this terrible sin you committed, and now you're dictating? Anyone else, if it wasn't Moshe, would say, Oh, you're going to send an angel? Okay, good, good, good. I mean, we, we were just going to be wiped out. Whatever you say is good. <laughs> Anything is better. <laughs> Moshe says, no. I'm, I'm not worshiping an angel. I don't have a relationship with an angel. It's about you. If you're not going, we're not going. Is that not romantic? How can you even miss that? If you enjoyed this conversation or this topic and you're looking for more information or you want to hear it again from another angle, there is a way to do that. And that is in this book. It's all there. Order it from Amazon. You can read it, reread it, and share it. These ideas, these messages, this approach to life, this approach to Torah, to meaning, and to morals is vital for the world today, and we need to get this message out to the entire world. It is universal, it's essential, it's indispensable. To support this effort, if you want to be a partner in this crime, check out the link and make a donation. It really helps a lot. And thank you in advance.